Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, guys, we were bringing you medical information, uh, cutting edge science and cutting edge information with, from guests and patients, but none of this is personalized medical advice. You need to reach out to your own doctor. I know we've said it on the podcast before, but we're making it official now. Please realize this is not medical advice and talk to your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Low Carb MD podcast. Tro, we got someone that's that's special with us today, man. Good to see you. How are you doing? I miss you, man. I'm doing I'm doing so good. I'm happy to be here this morning with two amazing people. Brian, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And then today we have somebody special, somebody who's doing amazing work literally on the front lines in South Africa. Somebody who's inspired me that who's part of a uh, organization uh, that's really doing some amazing work on multiple fronts. Uh, yeah, this is going to be, this is going to be, I'm really excited about this one. Yeah, we have Jane Bullen from the, the Noakes Foundation and Nutrition Network, and they're doing some great stuff. I mean, what we, we started this podcast to really reach docs, and we're doing a good job, actually. We're having a lot of docs who are starting to understand and look at things differently. So, Jane, welcome. Tell us what you're doing and, and uh, how you're helping doctors to kind of get educated. Thank you. Thank you so much. So yeah, I mean, it's been obviously quite a long journey to where we've got to today and the Nutrition Network. Um, and it began when in 2014, when the Noakes family founded something called the Noakes Foundation, obviously, which was Prof Noakes' vision to put really his money where his mouth was and to put all of the money that he had made from his books in the low carb category into research. So that's where we began. And, and kind of here we are, seven, six, seven years later in a completely different area, which is training medical professionals around the world. So we've gone from Cape Town, South Africa to 24 countries and counting. Um, and our vision's grown and changed so much over the years. And it's really been a bottom up approach. So I'm quite excited to talk to you guys today about how we got to where we've got to and my own journey within that and why I'm so passionate about it. So thanks yeah. for having me. Yes. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you. Tell us your story and your struggles and how you got to Professor Noakes and, and to do what you're doing. Now. So I, I was, when I was 21, I'm 42, I'm turning 42 next week. So quite a number of years ago, I was told by my, I had a very, very progressive gynecologist who told me I had PCOS and insulin resistance. And that was like, I mean, a number of years ago before it was even kind of known as a condition. Um, so I knew that. And I then moved to Europe. And I lived in England and I had NHS doctors telling me to eat low fat, eat low GI, go vegan and exercise more for a number of years, for a decade. So I did that, as we all do as patients. Um, and I was very good about it and I was very passionate about it. And in the end, I was vegan and I was following a strict, like super low GI, almost no GI diet. And at one point of my journey, I actually gave up my job and became a full-time dance teacher and I was dancing 12 hours a day to kind of keep my weight at bay and try and improve my health. And I just got worse and worse. And it's a story of millions, of course. What happened to me was my insulin resistance, my metabolic disease progressed over those years. I spent millions, um, you know, I, spent, I could have bought a couple of houses, a couple of hotels and the amount of money I spent on medical professionals trying to get help and answers that just made it worse. So that's what led me to eventually the journey with the Noakes Foundation and discovering low carb and going, oh my God, how is this possible that we've been so wrong for so long? Yeah, it's really I'm frustration. It is really frustrating. And, you know, I was just telling Tro about a patient I had. He came to me and, you know, for the last two years, every three months, his note says, <clears throat> exercise more, eat less. And they gave him links to two vegan movies and they go, that's it. Three months later, he comes yeah. back gains weight, A1C, now he's full-blown diabetic, and now he's seeking me. He has a full coverage healthcare with his HMO, but he says, I, I just can't deal with these guys anymore. They're not helping me, so help me. And he says, just tell me what to do. And I think it's so frustrating, Tro and, and Jane. It's like the same, we all have the same story. It's like we keep doing the same thing, and, and that's insanity not to change the approach at some point. Tro? No, I mean, look, this is it. Uh, you, you mentioned the NHS, and now we know of kind of literally how diabolical uh, some of these issues are. And I say that in, with a grain of salt, but, you know, certainly doctors want to help people. But look at how 
we've had proven success with somebody in that system. The best performing GP is Dr. Unwin, and they literally dragged, uh, you know, withdrew his um, infographics that have been wildly propagated, wildly successful. And then a month later, they, they you know, wrote about it in the Sunday Times. And then a month later, they started supporting soups and shakes, right? Uh, soy protein, processed food, you know, soups and shakes that were low calorie. So it's, um, it's upsetting that, you know, we were all, we've all been subject to this. You know, yeah. all three of us here have been subject to it. And it's unfortunate. Yeah. I think the interesting thing is, it's quite a strange thing as a lay person or as a non-medical person. You work in an environment, so I've been in a marketing research strategy field for 25 years. And in that kind of arena, if something doesn't work, within days you start to change, change your strategy. You change tack very, very quickly. So when I was working in magazines, we were doing kind of daily magazine and newspaper cover analysis we were doing eye tracking if something didn't sell we would change the price the next day then we'd change the cover model then we'd change the fonts so we were constantly working on our strategies to to grow sales you know of course in medicine understandably things are slower and there's a completely different approach but it's unbelievable as a patient it's unbelievably difficult to navigate and that's the challenge. And that's where patients become so unbelievably frustrated. No, that's not the challenge. The that's the market. That's not the challenge. They've made a market that supports continually needing them because they will get you success buying their fruit, you know, their shakes and soups. And then when you go back to the real world without the tools you need to survive, okay, eating real food, low carb food, nutritious foods, right? okay, low processed carb food, I really should say, and low sugars, when they don't give you those tools and you go back and you fail, you blame yourself and they now have mm -hmm. a recurring customer. So they have mm -hmm. literally done what you've said. They've engineered mm -hmm. recurring business and the mm -hmm. processed food companies are very happy because they get to make you happy gaining the weight, eating their foods, and then they get to make you happy when they sell you the processed food crap to lose weight because you're doing something for your health. And so everybody's happy until you're on pharmaceutical drugs. And sorry about my little rant here. Brian's like rolling his eyes. Tro's on it. No, again. no, I'm, I'm, no, Tro, I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm rolling my eyes because I'm thinking it's so true. It's like no one has a vested interest in making the patient healthier because everyone's making money off the patient. They're the product. <laughs> they're they're so the ones, kind of right? Being at the opposite ends of a stick, you know, you kind of go in as a patient wanting to understand what's going on with your health and you leave with a packet of pills and then you get progressively worse. And I think that's the frustration is that, you know, I got to the point where I was kind of scared to go into any kind of medical environment and I would do absolutely anything to avoid it in the end. In fact, to the point that I actually flew to Taiwan and went to a Chinese doctor in a rural village and sat on the street corner waiting to see him for 12 hours and then spent kind of two months salary on a box of herbs because I was so desperate for my health and I would have done anything at that point. And it's unbelievable, you know, because 10, 15 years ago, there weren't people like the two of you. There was no one to ask. And in fact, the, the irony was when I joined the Noakes Foundation, that was where this journey for the, as the Nutrition Network began was Prof Noakes had, I think it was something like 3,800 emails that no one had ever read. So we were, you know, I sort of spoke to his secretary at the time and I said, well, who are all these people and why are they writing to him? And she said, oh, no, they're very, very desperate patients that have written to him about their health and he wants to reply to each of them. So sort of from three years before, there were like grandmothers that had gout complaints and people that had heart attacks that had written to him desperate. And that was when we went like, well, who, is there no one that we can send these people to? You know, I mean, he wasn't a practicing doctor at the time. He was trying to retire. And then I started to go through the list myself and on this kind of little mock list that he had drafted up himself, there was kind of one low carb cardiologist or guy who said he was low carb in my neighborhood and I booked an appointment with him and sat for an hour and a half having the lecture of how I needed to stop eating avocados and olive oil. You know, and then I was like, well, he shouldn't be on the list. Why is he on the list? Who is, is there anyone that we can send patients to and trust that they just know the science? And back then in 2014, there were very, very few people. There were a couple of people in our country. Um, you know, and, and what do people do? What have people done? They've just gone and done it on their own. They've, do, they've done their own thing. They gave up on medicine. They said, I'm over it. I'm not going to try anymore. I'm not going to go and ask my doctor's advice. I'm just going to do what I want and do what works for other people. 
And South Africa is an amazing country because we've kind of, it's been a bottom up thing. So the South African people just decided to start banting, which is what, you know, it's keto in the States. But that's why we've got the Banting Seven Day Meal Plan here with two and a half million people on it. That's why the books that we've published here have been so successful, because they just gave up going to doctors eventually. And they eventually said, we're just doing this. And because of that, the medical profession had to change. They stopped seeing patients. Patients stopped going to dietitians. Um, very early on in my journey at the Noakes Foundation, an ex-dietitian came to us and said, you stole all my patients. They told me that they were buying your book instead of coming to me. And now I've had to convert to a low-carb clinic, and now I need your help. I need to understand it. I can't just read your book and then practice this. I need medical support with this journey. And that's where we began the Nutrition Network and went, okay, we're going to have to offer some kinds of training so that we can at least understand that people know the basics. So you, we know that if a doctor comes to anyone that you've had a conversation with, the two of you understand who in your community actually practices the same principles now. But five years ago, we had no idea. So people were like, woohoo, I'm low carb. And then they were telling people to eat bread and oats and fruit and you know, doing the wrong things entirely. So it's been a big journey to find a way to legitimize and grow the network and the groups of support and people like Doug and yourselves are doing that through the incredible work that you're doing now, but it, it just didn't exist before. So we're kind of all in this together and we're building communities. Yeah. You know, th th this is the problem. Uh, our, and you've, you've hit the nail on the head and Brian, I know you feel strongly about this. Our profession has failed. Doctors, dietitians, Okay, the politicians that deal with public policy as it relates to nutrition, obesity, and weight governance, okay, they have failed for the last 50 years. They have failed, and they don't want to admit it. And they want to blame you by saying all diets work. You know, we have to, you, patients have to find the diet that they can adhere to. That is a way for them to pass the buck to you and blame you. It is not a you know, it is not a viable approach. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked. And what you guys are doing, educating doctors about, you know, approaches that really they're, they really need to know a lot more is amazing. And I hope one day maybe there'll be room for me at the Nutrition Network to, to help because educating physicians is a big passion of mine. Um, because I wish, you know, I was in the most prestigious system in the Yale, you know, in the Northeast, in the Yale system. And I was told by the smartest endocrinologists and cardiologists to eat less and move more. And it's despicable in my opinion. And what you guys are doing is amazing work. So I just wanna, and the, the, the problem, you're absolutely right. We have failed. And we failed for the last 50 years and nobody's taken responsibility. They've let the patients blame themselves when really they should be saying, why are we terrible? Why is our advice and approach terrible? Sorry, I know so I Brian's like, oh my God, Tro's on another one of his rants, you know? <laughs> no, I mean, wait, you're preaching in the choir here. We're, we're, we all experience the same thing, Tro. I think, you know, every day, every single day, I see patients and they say, yeah, I blew it. I did this thing and I, I did this medical weight loss stuff, a liquid diet, and I lost 80 pounds. I gained back 100 pounds. And then I was I'm like, it's not your fault. This physiology that was the fault, right? It, it was unsustainable what you were doing. And now people have a fear of losing weight and then gaining it back because that's what they've done their entire life. That's what we've all done. So I think when you give people those tools, that's why the nutrition network is so valuable. And again, the more doctors you reach, each of those doctors on average is going to have 2000 patients that they're going to impact. So every doctor we reach, we realize that helps us. Plus we learned from professor Noakes. We don't want to be a single person out there, you know, yelling in the desert because then everyone attacks you because there's vested interests for sure. There's no doubt about that. It's very clear based on what we're seeing. So, you know, I think there's strength in numbers and the med in, in order to change the standard of care, we have to have enough doctors practicing that way. And that's really, really critical. So, so we still, we were only scratching the surface. So I was looking at our numbers before this talk today and we've, we've trained about, we're coming up to about 4,000 people in around 20, 25 countries. So wow. that gives us what about, if you split that out evenly, we've got around 200 doctors and professionals in those countries, give or take. That's not a lot. I mean, if we think of the fact that there are over a million physicians in my understanding and just in the United States, the, the big work is really still to come. So it's like we've scratched the surface and we talk within our communities, 
but actually the, the mainstream medical profession still is practicing the standard American diet, which is sad. It is the sad because we know that we're not changing things fast enough. And our interest, particularly my interest, I mean, I've got a 12 year old son and I see what he eats at school today um, in you know the city that Prof Noakes lives in and that we've had such a dramatic impact on. And they still check their sandwich boxes every day. And if they don't have carbohydrates in there, they get a little note, uh, the parents are told off, like they want them to have bread. They tell them you need to have bread in this sandwich, in this lunchbox. You know, so, so the big, we've got a huge job ahead of us. And it feels like we're making headway, but it's really important sometimes I find to step out of the low carb community and go, okay, this is the reality here. We, what have we got to do? We've got so much work to do still. And it's so important. And we're all doing our absolute massive task here of kind of fighting a system that doesn't support change. And COVID set us back. I don't know if it's been the same in your country, but certainly in South Africa, we've had a lot of food packages. Um, you know, poverty has contributed to it. So people have just been eating what they can, which has gone back right down to that kind of refined carb story again. People are getting food parcels with just milli meal, which is maize, um, vegetable oils, sugar as like a baseline nutrition. If you remove those three things, the entire world's metabolic health improves in, a, in three days. If you remove those three things, the entire country, the entire world's metabolic health improves between three to six days of restricting those. How about that, Brian? Evidence-based statements. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the reality. And that's the, the travesty, really, of our government right now and our health uh, advisors. Are not, they're not talking about metabolic health. They're saying, yeah, yeah, a lot of obese and diabetics are dying of, of COVID. But then they aren't saying, hey, guys, we need to take this seriously and start cutting out processed food and sugar. They don't mention a word about that. And that's how you're healthy. I, I see patients every day, and I know every day I see them. Um, they're getting healthier and they're less likely to die of COVID from better metabolic health. We know that from immune functioning. We know it from, from who's dying of COVID. Um, and, and it's so, it's so frustrating because no one's really talking about that. I haven't heard Fauci say, Hey, we got to go out there and we got to really change our lifestyle. We got to exercise. We got to take care of ourselves. We're locking up people inside, telling them not to exercise. Don't talk to other people. Don't have social engagement, be stressed out, stress eat. That's why people are eating their, their, their sugary cereal that they had as a kid because they want to go back to their happy place, right? And so we're making the disaster worse by the way we're managing it, by not even discussing it, at least throw it out there and then let people decide if they care about their health enough to, to make some changes. My patients do. And I think we're cheating the system because we're selecting for people who care and are motivated because they've been destroyed by the system. And, and just one other political thing, because I have over 35 patients now from a major HMO in Southern California. 35 patients are paying me outside of their system and they're paying for that insurance. Why? The system's failing them. Their diabetes is getting worse and they're on horrible drugs and cheap drugs because it's cheaper rather than newer drugs that might be more beneficial in their case, but they can't afford it and the, the system doesn't allow them to check an insulin level. So guess what? They've selected that the, the, the irony is I'm going to save their system a ton of money in those 35 patients. I'm going to help prevent all the complication of diabetes, which is the biggest expense for healthcare. <laughs> right? Dialysis, heart, heart attack, strokes, all those kind of things. And uh, the patient's paying out of pocket in addition to paying them. They're getting the best deal in the world right now. So, so there's a lot of work still to be done. And that's the bottom line. So what we've done at the Nutrition Network and the Noakes Foundation is we looked at our government's NCD, our non-communicable disease plan and strategy for the next 10 years. And we tackled every one of those touch points that was on their strategic plan. And we've over the last six years been knocking on doors constantly going labelings on your plan. So if you're labeling, if labeling and awareness is on your plan, you've got to have sugar warnings. You've got to have labeling that's consistent. You've got to have a strategy that just is very, very simple in understanding what net carbs and sugars are. And we've got very, we haven't got anywhere there. Then we tax on the next door, which was around advertising control. Same story. So it's been like a consistent chipping away at different aspects of the strategy. Um, education's been on there. So we created something called Eat Better South Africa, which was an educational platform. We haven't found funding on a national level for it, though. So it's been very much self-funded. So the place that we've landed is in the medical community now. Because doctors have 
desperately needed this education because patients have asked for it. So it's been an incredible bottom-up story where patients have gone and said, I'm not going to come back to you unless you actually give me good advice on how to reduce my insulin. And I want to follow the diet that Professor Noakes reversed his diabetes on. So it's been amazing that it's actually come from patients. And many of the doctors on the Nutrition Network, when we ask them why they did our courses, they say, oh, one of my patients lost you know, 100 pounds and I could not believe it. And I didn't believe him. And eventually he told me he did this course. So it's unbelievable, but it's, it's also not great. You know, it's not quick enough. It's not the right way to be tackling things. It's got to, at some point, the medical profession has to tip and start actually inviting you, Brian, and you, Tro, and all of the lecturers on these courses to, to give lectures at universities and to influence students so that the next generation of doctors actually has this in their toolkit. How else are we going to move forward? Oh, let me tell you, I'm, uh, well, first of all, I'm so passionate about everything you're saying. I think the job of each doctor is to go out and, and you know, shepherd and, and heal and help and reach out and touch at least 500 people. If I can touch 500 people's lives, keep them weight normal, prevent diabetes, you know, make sure there's no dyslipidemia, if I can do that, right? Just 500 people. I feel like, and, and if I can get some of those 500 to evangelize their families, right? If I can get them to evangelize their, their surroundings, draw in their wives and husbands and brothers and sisters, right? To, to heal in the ways that they have, I've done my job, right? And what you guys are doing is reaching 2,000. Imagine if those two or 4,000 doctors Imagine if 4,000 people touch 500 people, right? Which is doable for a doctor. Brian, you think you can touch 500 people's lives? Yeah, you know, I think, and just tying this back to the Nutrition Network, I gave a lecture for them a couple of years back and, you know, I forgot all about it. I was in Boca Raton at a low carb conference and one of the great docs who was really fantastic. He said, Brian, we're having a glass of wine and a steak, as a matter of fact. And he said, Brian, you know, your lecture really impacted me. You have to take yourself more serious in this role. And I was like, wow, because he's impacting a lot of people. I was like, wow, that's kind of cool that, you know, what the Nutrition Network's doing is allowing us to say, okay, are these reasonable people? And that's why I get you to try to get you to be reasonable, Tro. Uh, but, you know, people can decide. And I think, you know, we, like you said, Jane, it's this bottom up because, for instance, Tony Hampton, who's a great low carb doc uh, in, in Chicago, he's, his community, the people couldn't buy vegetables. Why? Because none of the stores had them because no one was buying them. There was no demand. So the store owner said, I'm not going to stock vegetables and fruit because no one's eating it. And it goes bad. He said, well, if I can guarantee you that patients will buy vegetables at your store, will you stock them? So this one store starts stocking vegetables and meat and, and different things that people can eat. He goes, look, here's what my patients need. And now there's a demand for his product. Now he's going to have that product. Before, he was, he's a businessman. He can't just have vegetables that no one's buying because no one cared about vegetables because all they're buying is the processed food. So he stocks that. So I think that's a big thing of, of the bottom up. And I know um, the Noakes Foundation is going into the, to the poorest areas and saying, okay, let's change what you're doing in a cost-effective way. Because that's always the, the, the frustrating thing is the critique is this. Okay. First, they say low carb doesn't work. Then they say, yeah, it works, but you have to keep doing it. If you stop doing it, it doesn't work anymore. It's like, yeah, so you don't prescribe blood pressure medicine or, or cholesterol meds because if you stop them, it goes back to how it was before. So it's an intervention. <laughs> it's a change. It's a lifestyle. It's not a short-term fix, right? You can't say, I'm going to do low carb for a month and then go back to your old ways. And that's what my patients understand. They go, this is my lifestyle now. So I think there's so much of that. <clears throat> when there's a demand now, you know, my wife said she went to the you know, to Costco yesterday, all the heavy whipping cream is gone, the butter is gone. There's a reason for that, right? Because people are starting to understand. They go, hey, I'm gaining weight. I want to do low carb or keto. So, uh, and there's a demand. So now they're going to stock those things more, you know, because they're selling it. It's, it's a business. Everyone's in a business. And, you know, I was, Joe and I have been called out a couple of times by kind of saying, oh, this is the evil food industry and all that. But no, they're providing what people want. That's the problem. And, and, and people are addicted. And so when you have an addict, it makes it really easy to provide what they want because they're addicted to what you're selling. You know, so I think it's a big, big problem. And I think this ground up because if people stop buying certain, if you stop watching certain movies, they're no longer going to make those violent movies because <clears throat> there's no market. Right. So we provide the market. Then we criticize them for making what we're demanding. If that makes sense. So in, some, 
So in South Africa, we've got a very interesting story where people, so maize didn't exist in our country before the Portuguese settlers came to South Africa and to Africa. They brought the maize seed with them, which is now known as mealy meal, mealy papier. And the marketeers in South Africa are unbelievably talented and intelligent. And they've positioned the, this particular food, which is called pap, which is like a crushed maize porridge. It's very, very stodgy, very white. It's a bleached, refined carb, basically. People in South Africa believe that it's their traditional cultural food and it's marketed in the most incredibly intelligent way. And it's, it's overwhelming how successful big grains and big refined carbs are in this country in particular because of that, because they're cheap, they have long shelf life. Um, and people that live in Lokshan, which is in, an, you know, in township environments, don't have access to cold chain storage. So they can't really get fresh foods easily. It's very difficult to keep foods fresh if you don't have a fridge. So we're in a little bit of a cultural dilemma here where we actually find it very difficult to get healthy fresh foods to people. They live in places that don't have gardens, so they can't start to do their own veg garden. They can't keep chickens. They can't access cold chain foods. Um, tricky, you know. So we've got to look at a much bigger system change. And that's the bottom line. Is it's all, you can't really say to people, you know, you can't say to people that don't earn more than a dollar a day, go and eat eggs. You can't give them the green list and say, off you go. You know, go and eat healthily. There's a lot more to it. There's a huge systemic change that has to happen. And it's been a huge amount of work to get to the point where we can start to offer people from very, very low incomes dietary advice in a responsible way. Um, and we've got there. We've kind of found ways to do this creatively. But again, a huge amount of responsibility to that because if you give somebody a diet sheet and send them off, they don't have health care. They don't have medical aids, they don't have um, a doctor that they can go to. So typically in South Africa, about 86% of our country doesn't have private health care. So they have state medical support, which means if you're a type 2 diabetic, you go every three months and you get your blood pressure checked and you get one finger prick um, and you don't own a glucometer. So they don't know from three, in three-month intervals what their glucose is doing. And they don't have access to strips or to testing devices. So it's a really, really difficult dilemma that we're in as a country here in South Africa. And from what I've seen, it's not that different in the United States and in other countries either. There are people that just can't afford basic kind of interventional medicine and they can't afford insulin and they can't afford all of those things. So for us, it's the only solution for survival for many people in this country. They just don't have other ways of actually treating their diabetes. So that's where we're at is kind of going, you, you're probably going to die if you don't follow this diet. You know, you're going to go home and you're going to not get better. And it's difficult. It's difficult to manage. It's difficult for our doctors that work in state health care. And it's very, very hard for the patients and their families to deal with. Um, so we, we've got a very, very driven reason for wanting this to work and for wanting a system change and, and for finding ways to get more affordable, healthy foods into the food chain. But again, so far and such a long journey that we've got to get there. And we don't have the answers. We, that's why the nutrition network is becoming so important, is to find these answers collectively with the medical community around the world. And we're hoping that every single one of you and all of us is going to find better ways to work together. And that's the thing. You know, when we say medicine's failed, I agree with you, Trevor. It has failed. The, you know, it's failed itself, perhaps. But at the same time, we, I don't want to point a finger at anyone. Because I think that what's happened is we've all just followed what we were told to do and what we were taught. And then we've got to go, oh, my God, okay, well, this hasn't worked. And let's just like, in a way that's non-accusatory, find better ways to change the system. See, you have a marketing, that, back, you have so. a marketing background, but I have a, uh, you know, I, I was trained on the streets, you know, I, I, you know, so to speak. And let me tell you, if I was in a hospital and I was using an antibiotic that didn't work and I kept using it and I kept blaming the patients that that antibiotic, the fact it didn't work is because they couldn't take it the way I wanted them to, okay, that wouldn't fly. So if this was anything else but obesity, you know, and weight loss, we would hold the, you know, the doctors and the dietitians more accountable. So I don't want to make people feel like you know, defensive mm -hmm. in saying that we have failed. We just have mm -hmm. to admit the truth. We have failed. Uh, and we're failing and we're getting worse as time goes on. And there's something more coercive and powerful than our effect, right? We have to admit that. And once we admit that, then we can grow. 
But if we don't admit failure, you know, and it's just reality. And you know what? You've, you've hinted at it. You've said you had, you've went to every single expert. You went to China, <laughs> like some Chinese guru and spent millions of dollars. Why? Because nobody knows what the hell that they're doing. And the fact that you are now sublimating and teaching 4,000 doctors, I find that so inspirational. And the fact that Nutrition Network has these, these programs to teach physicians is just beyond, you know, it's amazing work. And, I'm, you know, I'm very honored to be, you know, call you a colleague and a friend. And this is amazing and, and, and I'd say mandatory work. So I wanted to tell you about the, my dietitian experience. Before I got into nutrition, I went to, I saved up. It was just after I'd finished university. And I, I waited for four months to go to the celebrity dietitian. And I was told she was going to sort me out. And I went onto this diet that she put me on for six weeks. And I counted beans, literally, like I've never stuck to anything so religiously in my life. And on week six, I went for my final checkup and I'd lost 100 grams, 100 grams. And she looked me in the eye and she said, you have lied to me and you have not stuck to this diet. Wow. And I, I, walked, I stormed out. I paid her, which was like half my salary and walked out. And the next morning, it was my sister's daughter's naming ceremony. And she had asked me to stop at the local bakery and fetch a hundred croissants and two cakes. And I was standing in the queue with all these boxes and I felt this tap on the shoulder and it was her. And she gave me this <laughs> finger. She, <laughs> oh my goodness, oh my that's God. great. Are you that kidding? is great. And she said, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> oh and it's, I mean, the list is so long. Like when I first started at the Noakes Foundation, I made a list of all of the, the doctors and specialists that I'd seen in my 20 year journey with metabolic disease and the amount of money that I'd spent at each of them. And it was, I felt extremely angry, you know, because you can't not as a patient, you can't not think of that one gastric enterologist that diagnosed me with fatty liver disease and told me that I needed to buy a new pair of trainers. He told me, he said, buy some trainers and get shopping for your lettuce. That's what he told me. And I wrote back to him and I said, but I do 40 hours of exercise a week and I eat only lettuce. I only eat green vegetables <laughs> and he never applied <laughs> yeah it, it is so maddening for people i mean I, I as a doc you know for years we put people on insulin they gain 30 pounds you look at them like they're idiots like what's wrong with you i don't know doctor i'm trying to watch my diet i'm trying but the insulin obviously we know insulin is a problem that you everyone gains weight when they start insulin right it is definitely an issue so the doctors judge the patient and say you're not listening to me but the problem is we're giving bad advice and they are listening and they're trying to do what we're saying but it, it's just not working and and mm -hmm. i'll tell you the other tragedy and it's no better in the united states my practice now if i have someone with metabolic disease that we really need to focus on i'm meeting with them every week i have a 24-hour glucose monitor on them because these people can afford to, to do that and it's maybe you know 60 to 100 dollars depending on on where they get the 24-hour uh, mm -hmm. glucose monitor mm -hmm. uh we can tell and people self-police because they say they check and they say oh my goodness i had orange juice my sugar went to 200 they know they're like okay i'm not doing that again but the problem is where they go, you know, and that's why I've had two nutritionists that I work with. I said, here, put a CGM on for a, a month. You owe it to yourself and to your patients, at least to know the effects of what you're eating. <clears throat> and both of them call me back like really stunned. They say, oh my gosh, what do I do now? Because what I've been telling people isn't right. And I have retired nurses and doctors that I take care of. And it's incredible how we've been so brainwashed just, just to believe and not to say, well, why is that? Why is it that with every meal I'm giving insulin to get rid of the sugar I'm giving you? Why not cut the sugar and not give insulin in each meal? So I'm having mm -hmm. patients now, and I love it because I can see it. When, they're, when they eat, their sugars drop <laughs> because they're not eating carbohydrates, and their body doesn't have to kick out more energy from their fat stores anymore when they eat. Yeah. And so their sugars drop consistently whenever they eat. And so like, how much insulin should I give them with each meal when it's dropping their sugar every time they eat? And it's so frustrating because it's clear. I mean, it's, it's, it's universal this happens, right? So anyways, it, it, that's why it's so exciting what you're doing is educating doctors who can reach out to those, those patients and help them. And the worst thing, and I'll tell you, most of my patients I have now, it's because their doctors say, yeah, sure, you lost weight, your A1C got better, you're in, not in the diabetic range anymore, You've, you know, your, your visceral fat's down, your alcoholic, uh, your, your uh, fatty liver's gone, uh, but you're killing yourself because your cholesterol went up three points, but their HDL went up 20 points right? Mm -hmm. So the ratio is even better than it was before. Their triglycerides dropped to nothing. And so it's frustrating because these patients say, gosh, the doctor didn't even say, hey, good luck with good thing with weight loss. Or I just say, don't tell them what you're doing. Just do it. 
right? Let them monitor it. And then they're, they're happy as can be. Say, so I just do a mod modified Mediterranean diet or I just cut out processed food. Everyone's happy. But if you say keto or low carb, everyone flips out. So, but it's the same thing. Modified Mediterranean or, you know, cutting out processed foods. That's what we're talking about is the big thing. Then we can gnash hairs over which, whether you're going to have more fish or more steak or whatever you can afford or eggs or whatever it might be. But I think that's the, the big stumbling block for a lot of us is, is we have a preconceived notion without really evaluating or researching it. So one of our, a family friend of ours wrote to me yesterday and she's lost, she went keto and she's been exercising a lot more than she ever has in her life. And she's lost 60 kilograms in 304 days, which is pretty good. I mean, that's kind of half her body weight. And she wrote to me yesterday and she said, I need your help. My brother's a doctor and my gynecologist have both staged an intervention and they've told me I'm too, I've lost too much weight too fast and it's not okay. I'm going to kill myself. What can I do? And it's like, where do you refer these patients? We're still in the same position that we were four years ago when we started this journey, which is that somebody, she lives in quite a small town in South Africa that doesn't have any of our kind of nutrition network doctors on it. So she's seeing people who are mainstream medicine. We've got a huge job ahead of us. And that's the bottom line. And that's the message that we, you know, keep telling all of our practitioners on our network and all of our lecturers is we feel like we've changed, the world's changed and it has We've seeded changes in the world that are fundamental and necessary, but we've got a huge job to still do. It's the beginning of a journey. It's not the end of the journey and things haven't tipped and policy hasn't changed and we are doing work for the next generation, but it's, we need an army. That is the bottom line. We need a much, much bigger army and we have to find ways to do that. So it's amazing to see the reach that, you know, the work that you and Tro are doing and the growth in the community in the States, but we've got to amplify that. Somehow we've got to really, really amplify that voice in the next years. Yeah, and that's the hope. I think when people listen, I think docs who listen with an open mind say, let me look at this and let me try it with my patients because we're trained on the front lines to observe our patients. And if we see them getting better, okay, we're gonna keep doing that. Um, the problem is, and we have a major problem, at least in the U S with physician burnout because doctors, especially female docs have a higher suicide rate than the general population. Um, male doctors also, but females it's staggering because they're dedicating their life to help people. And they realize they're not helping people. <laughs> then you say my life's so useless because I'm not doing what I set out to do. I, I had my nice white coat and I came in to save the world. And I see all my patients getting sicker and sicker. I throw more drugs and more drugs. And I have eight minutes with a patient and I can't talk about their husband passing away or, or the stresses in life. So it, it's, it's a system problem. And we have, to, it's not that the doctors are bad. It's just that, how are you going to, as a matter of fact, some of my old partners are sending patients to me now because they say, I can't help this patient in six minutes or eight minutes or 12 minutes. You have an hour to sit with them each time they come in, educate them and help them. Right. Because it's a I mean, disaster. It's I feel I actually want to publicly apologize to all of the doctors that I've been to in my, you know, until this point in my life, because I can imagine how terribly depressing it must be to, to be giving patients advice that just doesn't help them. It makes no difference. It makes them worse. They come back desperate. They, they're telling you that they've adhered to your advice. You, you kind of don't believe them because they're not following the trains. You know, it's, it can't be, it must be one of the hardest jobs in the world. And it must be unbelievably depressing to the point that it would drive you to suicide because you're really following your passion. And if there's one thing I know, it's that doctors chose their careers because they absolutely love people and want to help other human beings. I mean, I've never met a doctor that hasn't had that vision and that hasn't wanted to just be there for other people and love them and support them and heal them and to, to consistently fail. I mean, I just can't think of anything worse then going day in and day out in this journey where you're just failing patients and turning them away. And I've seen that. I mean, you know, Hasina's story. She was one of our medical directors. She yeah. just, I, I would go into her hospital. I would have to take my little kind of rescue remedy and my little like lucky stone and do deep breathing before I even went in there because it was such a difficult environment, even to just visit, like seeing the absolute terrible ill health of people in our country in a state hospital. And seeing like the absolute frustration and the kinds of patients that she was dealing with, trying to save lives of people who are just at the end stages of metabolic disease in their early 30s and 40s. I mean, it was so difficult to witness and to actually participate in this. And then at some point we did a nurse's, she did a nurse's intervention and we kind of went in and worked with her a bit. And I mean, just seeing the health of the nurses and how terribly, terribly ill they all were. 
was even harder than seeing the patients to some extent. You know, it, it's like being in a system, a cog in a system that you just can't improve on. Well, so if, I, I yeah, have to you, Brian, if you left it, because what else do you do? How do we create a system where you don't have to leave it, where you can be in that and really succeed? And that's when we've won, you know? Yeah, unfortunately, what it's going to come down to is finances, because I know what's going to happen. These HMO plans are going to reach out to doctors like myself and Tro and say, well, what the heck are you guys doing? Because they're going to see, like Dr. Unwin has shown, his costs for his patients are way down. His drug costs are way down. In America, we fight all the time about, oh, the rising costs of drugs. Well, how about getting them off the drugs rather than the lower, lowering the prices all the time? We're talking about lowering the price of insulin now. You know, the president is talking about that at length. Like, well, why don't we get people off insulin rather than the lowering the price? I mean, lowering the price helps if you need it, obviously. Obviously, there's some people who need it. But you say, well, if we didn't have so darn many people on insulin, there wouldn't be a shortage. <laughs> That's a problem yeah. is that we're, sh we're giving so much and then it's a market value now. So again, it's supply and demand. And that's the frustrating part is how do we get to the point? Because at some point, the HMO and plans have to look and say, this doctor saving me from dialysis, stents, bypass surgery, you know, a long gone amputation, blindness, all these things that they're paying all their money for. And now we don't have money to properly nourish people. Because we're spending it all on the complications of the food that we're giving them. It's, it's insane. Because when you look at government programs, what are they giving them? Starches, sugar, you know, sugary food. I, I look at it and, and I, I, my, a friend of mine has a gym right next to a, a, a women and children's clinic for underserved people. And you see the boxes they come out with, with cheese crackers and, and uh, um, you know, it's all garbage food. And I was like, holy cow, no wonder they got troubles. And then they're going to buy insulin with the rest of their money because this food is causing them to have this problem. And they're, they're, you know, gallons of juice and all this stuff. So I look at it and say, like, oh my goodness, the, the, the intervention would be, hey, guys, whoever it is. And the problem is, like you're saying, it's hard to get traction because the food companies, the drug companies, all these people are not going to be for you. That's where all the fun is. I mean, you look at advertising on TV, that's who it is. Every ad you watch is either food company or pharmaceutical company. And then at the end, they say, well, this drug could cause you to go blind and your eye could fall out and all, all this other stuff. Um, and it's hard because you say, gosh, lifestyle could help a lot of these things. And plus the other thing we don't, you know, stress, anxiety. I mean, in the, in the, in the poor communities, there's a ton of problems as far as, uh, you know, social things where single moms and they have no one to help support. And, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, it's all that constant stress. And then we stress eat and then you get into this whole cycle. And it's, it's a really, really difficult problem to, to address. But what you're doing is getting people into those communities and, and educating. And that's the critical part. Yeah, so we've, we've kind of accepted that we can't go in with a medical story into communities where people are under such daily stress and trauma. And we've really, really taken an approach that's purely educational and, and motivational. And that's where our advisors and coaches say, play such an important role, is they're really just doing it from a, a boosting morale, getting people to stick to the diet. Um, some people need to see a doctor. Most don't. Most people just need to make those changes and their lives change. And then they've got it. The biggest bit is getting them to stick to it. And that's the difficult bit. And, and that's where we've fallen short with actual state support and advocacy is we've gone to like government departments and we've, we've shown them the results. We've shown them the lives that have been changed by our work. And they've just said to us with such respect. I mean, I have such respect for the difficult job that these people do, but they've said to us, we're trying to get water, clean water, street lights and housing to these people and full tummies you know we're just trying to get like we're working on the absolute front line of starvation particularly in south africa um and we can't worry about that like we're just gonna people are gonna get diabetes they're gonna get obesity they're gonna have chronic disease we're gonna manage the fallout or not in a lot of cases a lot of people are just kind of drop, dying of heart attacks before they're even diagnosed of things and keeping them alive is the priority. So there are these massive complexities. And I really respect that. I mean, it, it's very hard to, to challenge that, you know, especially with COVID where people have lost incomes. But at the same time, well, how can we, when we know the cost that that takes on state healthcare and on the taxpayer, we've got to keep doing the work that we're doing with compassion and with understanding and with inclusivity and and for me that's become it's quite a complex thing but it's kind of looking at like micro changes as well so not necessarily saying to somebody that's really struggling with their income you've got to give up your milli meal or you've got to swap it out for something that's more affordable but saying okay well can you put you know can you change that to make it 40 percent better can you put like two big tablespoons of peanut butter onto that 
so that it drops the, you know, drops the macros a bit. That's going to help you. That's going to give you a 20% better output, 20% better glucose control. It's not going to be perfect. That's why we call it eat better. Yeah, it's yeah, a hard it's it, it's a it's a hard one. You know, really, it's it's just kind of figuring out how how do you make the most impact you can. And, and here's the big problem, as I see it, is the doctor. I'll give I'll give an example. For 17 years, I was working 14 hour days every day, right? Getting up at 4:30 in the morning, trying to get a workout in, heading to the office, driving 40 minutes, half an hour, 45 minutes to get home at night, getting home at 8:30 at night after calling all my patients back for their lab results, all their sick stuff and, and, and adjusting medicines and looking at side effects and all that kind of stuff. So this doctor, how are you going to get this doctor to really educate themselves when they're just trying to survive? I mean, we're in survival mode. Doctors are in survival mode because you know, look at these studies where, where 88% of Americans are metabolically sick. We have a ton of, and it's not that we have a shortage of doctors. We have an oversupply of sick patients, right? So we have to fix that problem. At some point you say, okay, young doctor, when you get your patients in, let's keep these patients healthy. And we'll give you financial incentive to do that. Right now, the, the big crazy part about our system is the sicker my patient is, the more I get paid. So if my patients get diabetes, I get paid more. If they get cancer, I get paid more in an HMO type system because I have more diagnosis codes I can put down. So my, my frustration was, okay, I'm taking diagnosis codes away from patients and I'm getting a pay in my salary by helping the patient, by spending a ton of time and taking time away from my family. And so I could see why physicians are burned out and frustrated. And especially if the one thing Tro, me and most doctors that we've had on the podcast and most people, we've all had our own struggles with weight and metabolic disease. And that forced our issue to figure this out, not just to go with the standard of care because it wasn't working. I was pre-diabetic and 60 pounds heavier two or three years ago, right? Eating green shakes and eating six times a day and doing exactly what they told me to do. And I said, well, this isn't working. I have to change tack because otherwise by now I'd have full-blown diabetes and be stressed and not sleep and all this other kind of stuff. So I think it's frustrating because a lot of the doctors have been thin and healthy their whole life. So they've never really had to deal with this. So they go, okay, all these patients are gluttons. They're not listening. Just like what happened to you, that's a standard where they say, you're not listening to me, obviously, you, you, you know, that's why you're doing, no, I'm listening, doctor. That's why I'm, I'm digging, I'm counting my, your bean counter, counting how many beans you eat and being so obsessed and stressed with it and it's not working. So then people mm -hmm. just say, forget it. I'm done with this thing. <clears throat> but, but what we need is, it, there, it's a big approach, but what I see is you have to have a motivated patient, first of all, you have to have an educated doctor who understands mm -hmm. stuff and not only understands physiology, you have to understand mental stuff, right? Why is this person mm -hmm. fail? Why does someone just jump on board and they get it? Just like quitting smoking or something. It takes a huge investment and it can't be the mm -hmm. doctor. Do I think ultimately what we're going to have is health educators, dietitian, nutrition. The problem is they're all trained by industry. Doctors are, my education came from industry that says, Hey, someone has high blood pressure. Here's the pill you give them. This is the best pill. My pill is better than his, his pill. And here's why. Instead of saying, okay, let's hit the root cause and try to get rid of four mm -hmm. different conditions at once. I'm stopping medications on a routine basis now, right? Because you don't need anymore. But I've been on 18 years. You don't need anymore. Your blood pressure is 110. You don't need blood pressure medicine. Your blood pressure is normal. Because they so, don't. So my, my appeal, if I can reach any patients with this message, it's, it's that they choose carefully who they choose to see in the medical pro profession. So it's like if you're a patient, which I've been for all of these years, struggling with these things, seeing the wrong people, spending my very hard earned money in the wrong places, be careful. Like just think about who it is that you're going to, to see when you get sick, when you have a problem with your sugars, when you have a problem with that. Like you could go to, to the doctor down the road because it's like the closest doctor who you've been going to your whole life. Or you could actually do the research and find somebody like you, Brian, or someone like Tro and go, okay, they actually have taken this extra step. And they are offering this. And it's the same story. You know, it's, I hurt my, I was dancing wildly on the trampoline a couple of weeks ago and hurt my back hip, put a little bit of something out for the first time ever, my first sports injury on a trampoline. And I, I was kind of immediately like wanting to rush to go and, you know, get the MRI and freak out and to get the diagnosis. And then I kind of stopped and I thought, okay, I'm not going to spend hundreds or thousands of dollars going into a medical system and going to see an orthopedic surgeon because they are going to give me a diagnosis that's going to imply that what they practice. So let me wait. Let me think about what I want as the output from this injury, how I want to recover from it, and then let me choose. And it's the same thing if you're diagnosed as diabetic or if you're overweight or if you have any of these things, you have to choose carefully. And, and patients don't do that. We don't have that education to kind of figure out how we're going to heal ourselves. 
we just we caught in a system that kind of takes us on a journey that's not always necessary and you can do things in different ways so i did not take medication for my injury i was in agony i went for therapy i went for physio i worked with it i i found a way to heal myself without having to go to a doctor and that was what i chose and it wasn't necessarily the easiest route but i don't like to take you know to go on a medical journey unless it's really necessary so i chose a different route that might have taken a bit longer it might have been a bit more challenging but it was what i chose and that's the thing that patients don't realize is that they do have a choice. If they're not in an acute situation, they can find a doctor that supports them. They can drive all the way to you or they can have a Skype consult with you instead of just falling into the default standard of care that makes them so, so, so much sicker, so much quicker. It, it's, it's really important. And, and that's the journey. It's like finding those people that support your health, and not your illness. Yeah, and, and you and, and you went on that journey, spent a lot of money, and it still didn't help you, right? And, and so that's the thing is, some of the, they call them world <laughs> experts, and they never really understand how to treat the patient, and it's really frustrating for the patient because they go, "Look, I went to three experts; they all said the same thing," you know, because there's a standard of care, and that's what it is. And so that that's the hard part. And I think the other part of it is having a good network of resources, saying, "Look, you're in Chicago." Here's Dr. Hampton. Here's another doctor. Here's a nutritionist in your area. So as soon as we get this mesh, and that's part of what we're doing with the podcast is finding doctors in every state. Mm -hmm. And we can have them on and go, oh, you're from New Orleans, whatever. You're from uh, Florida. You're, and, and so people can say, well, I'm in Florida. Maybe I'll call that doctor, right? So I think those are the things where we can make that connection like Uber does with, with people who want to uh, you know, drive and people who want to ride. It works. So I think that's kind of what we really have to look at too is getting a network uh, nutrition network, you know, low carb USA, whoever is doing that to have a, a, a set place where people can go and say, Oh, there's someone 10 minutes from my house. I'll drive there or an hour. I have people driving from Northern California, people coming in from other States and they go, I'll come every month to see you because they're desperate for help. And there has to be someone in their state that can help them. And there has to be someone, you know, that we can have, we should have 20 people in each day. We'd all do fine, right? So I think it's... Right. I mean, we have a lot of patients that come from very, like, faraway places that just don't have anyone. And that's the joy that COVID's offered us, is that we now can find someone anywhere in the world if we really want to. And if you're really committed and you find a doctor that's going to support you on this particular aspect of your health, they will be able to do it from wherever, in my understanding, within the legal application of that. So we have uh, had many people over the years that have flown from all over the world to sit with Prof Noakes for an hour and just ask about their health. And that's absolutely unbelievable. He's not a practicing doctor and he sort of does it, you know, like if he can and if it's, you know, someone that's really like a, he wants to have a coffee with. But it's unbelievable that there are people that are so committed to their health journey that they actually go that far to find that. And that's, that's the real calling. That's the real healing journey is to really find your own voice as a patient and to go, I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to take this appalling standard of care that like my parents dealt with and they all died of diabetes in their 50s. And I'm going to like make this completely new journey for myself and my, my ancestry and come to a specific person that's going to give me a different outlook on life. And, and that's and it, what Dr. Self and Tro are doing. Yeah, and They're it's not only it's not only that you have a patient. You know, her, her son-in-law brought her down here from Northern California to see me, and he goes, "Look, I'm sorry." He apologized in advance. She's she's gonna be your worst patient. She's not gonna listen. She's one of my favorite patients. She gets it. She's changed her life. Her son, her husband stopped drinking uh, soda. He was drinking five or six of them a day. He's losing weight. Her son's now looking and saying she's looking great and she's feeling great. Her mood's better. Her anxiety is better. All these things are getting better, right? Because Someone had enough love for her to bring her to me and, and trusted me and my knowledge to say, you can help her. No one else can. She has to drive all this way. It's ridiculous, first of all, that they had to do that. But second of all, she gets it and she made life changes. She bought in. She has a continuous glucose monitor. She knows what, what's going to spike her sugars, what doesn't. And she's doing fantastic. I mean, I'm shocked, actually, because I was prepared to say this is going to be a struggle. And I'll, I'll get in that. And she speaks only Spanish. So it's been fun for me doing that with her and, and you know, my Spanglish as skills. But, you know, but to see that and but the, the big fruit has been her whole family. She's impacting. Her, her son, her, and their whole family is getting healthier because someone cared about her enough to bring her. And then they're seeing the, the benefit in her life and they're doing it. So how do we, how do we, like, what, what can we do to help Nutrition Network? What, what's, what are your new, I know you have the new obesity modules and, you know, whatever you're doing now, let's talk about it to make sure we get it out there for other doctors or people that might be listening, yeah. so that they can contact so just, you and find you. 
thank you for asking that. Yeah, so we've obviously just, we fast-tracked a couple of elective modules this year in response to COVID, and the big one was the diabetes reversal module. And the most recent one that's just come out is the obesity risk and reversal module. So we've kind of gone, okay, these are the overt comorbidities. Let's look at these head on and tackle these as an absolute entity and body of work. So those are two of my favorite trainings that we've done ever, um, just because they are so profound and so obvious. Um, and I'm grateful to COVID that it's really highlighted how important those are for us to look at as conditions that can be reversed. Um, through dietary changes. And what's next is neurology. And we are building a group coaching module, which is in response to our programs that we've run over the years at Eat Better South Africa. So that will train advisors and doctors on how to apply single patient care into a group context and how to build programs for a number of weeks from six weeks to 12 weeks that really kind of reverse different medical conditions. And then we are building a certification program that starts in February where we, where a couple of doctors that have done all of our courses are going to pilot our first kind of really, really formal, intense examination and case study process. So we've got a lot of fun things coming up and it's been an amazing journey so far this year. We, we're so grateful. For some reason, what COVID did was it really made people aware that they needed to start applying lifestyle medicine more actively. And they've really, really jumped onto our courses in an amazing way. So it's given us the opportunity to, to expand our word and our voice. And we hope to keep doing that. Um, we're going to be working with you and Doug and the team at the STMHP in terms of how we work together to educate more people more broadly. And we're very, very excited. There's just so much going on at the moment. So the best thing to do is to find our doctors through our practitioner listings those are doctors that have done our trainings and have been kind of vetted by the nutrition network and then to find our courses and try them so what else can i say advisors yeah, and coaches yeah. how do they find you i mean do, what, what's the website they should go to to so get it's www.nutrition-network.org all right and the dash, don't forget the dash in there yeah yes, yes the dash and then yeah. on there is our trainings. Most of them, all of the medical ones have CPDs or CMEs globally applicable. And we've also, of course, we've got courses that are specific for dietitians and nurses, um, which are really worth mentioning and are interesting for those populations as well. Yeah, my office manager is going through some of the training and it's, she says it's astounding excellent training so it's important because then she knows how to talk to people and how to help people and and um, interview people and try to find out how to get them motivated and it's a group it's a it's a team effort you know so i'm really excited i have another friend who's going to be doing the training also and and i know a lot of us docs have have looked at it and and, and uh, participated so it's really exciting the impact this can have because again the more people you educate i think the big frustration for me as a doc when i started low carb a few years back there was no one in town except Brett Schur, who is who is the the um, medical director for Diet Doctor now, of course. So they stole him from me, but he was my cardiologist. I would just say, "Hey, go talk to him," and he'll. So it's hard when you don't have good cardiologists who understand this stuff, or a good neurologist, or a good psychologist or psychiatrist. And so, so building the network locally is the key for all of us. You know, a lot of times we just have to do it in house and just say, "Okay, look, let me call your doctor and explain it to him." And the doctor's busy; they don't have time to talk to you. They don't care. I mean, not that they don't care; they don't have time to hear another thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, there's another Doctor Oz thing that's going to go away, so I'm not going to learn it. Right? They think it's a, a, a yeah. fad that's going to be gone. But when you look at the science behind it, it is astounding. And I think wise doctors will look and say, okay, what's your clinical outcomes? Here's my clinical outcomes. Now that we're doing this kind of medicine, I have, I, I, I go, do you want to talk to 10 of my patients? <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing their ejection fraction get better. I'm seeing every uh, mm -hmm. health aspect getting better. And, and the big surprise has been the, the anxiety, stress, sleep, you know, all these things, getting their lifestyle, right. It's, it's worth the investment doctors out there. It's worth the investment, you know, educate yourself at least, even if you're not a low carb keto advocate, at least be educated because there's going to people be people who seek you out and you're not going to have any clue what they're talking about. You're not going to know to check a fasting insulin. You're not going to know the importance of the A1C and all these kind of things. So I think um, it's the education is critical. And one thing that came up just recently uh, you know, with low carb USA, someone asked me, well, if, if the continuous glucose monitor is so great, how come all the doctors aren't using it? And I said, well, the problem is if they don't understand the tool, it'll make things worse because they're going to look and say, oh, look, Jane's sugar spikes every day at noon. Let's give her more insulin at noon rather than saying, 
let's not eat that sandwich and, and french fries at noon, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem is we, we're so trained to throw a drug at every problem. When we see a problem, we're going to throw a drug at it, just like we do with mm -hmm. LDL cholesterol, like we do with hypertension, rather than saying, okay, why is their blood pressure high? Are they stressed? Have they gained 40 pounds? Is there insulin through the roof? And not look at those things because they don't know to look. I didn't know three years ago to look at this stuff. Now I get it. But, you know, I th so I think that's it's what's so critical about what you're doing. So everyone will have a link to this and to the Nutrition Network and what Professor Noakes has been through and what he's accomplished is astounding because, again, you know, really, because we have such respect here at, at our um, podcast and in our practices because if he didn't take the arrows and stand up, the door would have slammed shut for a lot of us. A lot of us would have said, I'm not, I'm not doing that. He could have walked into the sunset and been happy, you know, mm -hmm. just on his old, old stuff he had done. He had accomplished enough in his career for, for 50 doctors and he could have walked away and he did it in his courage and his, his determination because he's motivated like we are because we've seen the, the amputations and the, the non-healing ulcers and the blindness. And we've, a lot of us have seen it in our families and it's unacceptable. Yeah, I think that's been the thing is, is one of the things is the loneliness that it's been for doctors that are out there in, in communities where there isn't a big low carb network or understanding. And it's, it's been allowing people to collaborate and work together across, across disciplines, across specialities. So we've got everything from a, a huge amount of oncologists, gynecologists and obstetricians to ophthalmologists and veterinarians that have ended up coming on to our trainings and sharing knowledge across platforms and across uh, disciplines like this has been astounding and it's countered the loneliness of the experience of sitting in a hospital where you're the only physician that really understands the science of low carb being able to tap into the global story and go okay how am i going to treat this patient something anomalous has come up here let's look at that let's talk to the network let's share and prof Noakes is off ahead for that he's been through so much and he stuck it out he stuck it out and he didn't give up. He didn't back down. He didn't retract his statements. And that's what's really led this movement, particularly in South Africa. And I believe everywhere else to some extent is, is his bravery not to just kind of step back into the carb closet. You know, he tore those pages out of his book, actually out of the printed book and said, I'm not going back. Yeah. Despite and, and I, and I, and I thank you for that. I thank you for you. You're coming. And you look fantastic, by the way, you look bright and you look fantastic. I was, I've been thinking that the whole time. So I just want to tell you, and everyone else can't see you like I can, but you know, I think that in part of it is having a joy and a passion for what you do and, and a calling in life. And a lot of people just unfortunately don't have that. So I think when you have something that gets you out of bed that you're excited about, that you can't wait to go out there and impact that community and thinking and using your brain and saying, how do we fix this problem? Rather than saying, yep, yeah, there's a big problem. We can't do anything about it. So, okay, let's just keep doing what we're doing. You know, we need people like you who can really push it forward. And, you know, us docs mm -hmm. like Prof Noakes on his own trying to do marketing and get the word out, we're a disaster for sure. So we all have our role to play. And that's why I'm so happy that you're, you're part of this organization, that you're spearheading everything. And you've always been a pleasure to, to work with. And it's an honor to have you on the podcast. And yeah, uh, I'm so grateful. So grateful have, for all the amazing work that you're doing and the ways that you're chipping away at the machine from, a, from that side of the, the wheel. Yeah, I think you have to have a little thick skin and kind of just smile and say, okay. I always tell my, my physician friends, you know, like when they give me a bad time, I say, you know what? When all the data is out, I'm going to accept your apology and I'm not going to gloat and I'm not going to smile. I'll just say thank you for apologizing because you're wrong. <laughs> that's just the bottom line because I'm seeing my <laughs> patients. They'll come back to you and tell you because that's what happens. They see my patients and they're, they're thinking, how in the heck did they do? He's lucky. He's just lucky, right? But there's some, a, a, believe it or not, there's a little bit of science behind what we're talking about and clinical experience. And I think that's a critical key. So do you have any closing words for us? Some words of wisdom you want to leave our listeners with? or? or I do. I just want to say, keep chipping away and you don't have to wait for the apology because the way that you feel says it all. And I can see that in the sparkle in your eyes, Brian. I've seen, I've kind of seen you over the years and how the sparkles grown and how your smiles grown as you found this vision in this way. And that's enough. Yeah, I think we do. I think that's it. And, and, you know, I'll tell you the joy, I'll t really, like, like you said, seeking out, I had a new patient come to me and this really impacted me. This kid, Long uh, trouble with depression, anxiety, poor self-esteem, um, stress, mm -hmm. not having a lot of friends, being over 400 pounds. He couldn't weigh himself. Listening mm -hmm. to the podcast, he lost over 150 pounds at least. He, lost, he had to do low carb and keto for three months before he could weigh himself at 400 pounds. Now he's in the mm -hmm. 260 range, right? 
a completely different person, but he did it with no medical. He just did it. He, he said, look, I've had it. He looked at the sandwich he was eating and threw it in the garbage says, I'm done. And then he took the steps. I mean, that is unbelievable with no psychological support, no uh, family support to speak of. And it's, and he said, I'm just doing this. I'm done. And I think that's, that's a huge testimony of what we can do um, through nutrition network. And for all of us working together to, to help that person who's lost all hope. That's why, you know, we kind of changed our tagline now to um, no one's beyond hope. No, no one's beyond help. Right. Meaning there's hope for everyone. We just got to get to them and we got to reach them however we can. So We'll keep chipping away, as you said, and, and we'll continue the fight. But thank you for all you're doing. And, and uh, we'll have links and all this stuff to the show notes just to, you know, for docs. Go out and educate yourself. Learn. Do it. You know, it's really critical. Keep learning. Keep going. Keep learning. Thank keep going. So thank you very keep much. Going. Thanks, Jane. Thank you. Bye Say hi to Prof for us. We will. I will. <laughs> Bye.